This concludes our presentation. We are going to open it up to questions. So we can start with some questions that have been put in the chat box. Anyone who would like to ask their question verbally live, if you just use the uh, reactions button to raise your hand and we'll know you have a question you wanna ask. So Jen, I see a question asked by Jim that uh, apparently knows the Casper Cove project, who says awesome. there's no class required for uh, being an urchin calling volunteer at Casper Cove. Is the class required for Tankers Reef? We, we strongly encourage everybody who's going to be diving at Tankers Reef to take the class. Um, the Fish and Game Commission made a change in response to Keith's petition uh, that makes it legal to take urchins within the, the zone bounded that you saw on, on the map. Of course, if you take the class, you'll know exactly where that zone is. Um, we are asking that anybody who has not had the class not to dive on the 100 meter by 100 meter grid. Um, but the short answer is we'd really like everybody uh, who wants to help to take the class, please. Um, but it is not a legal. Right. Yeah, we're trying to get all of the divers that are gonna be working on the project to register for the project. That's, that's really key is to know what our, um, our diver effort is like. And if people do not wanna take the training, we, we need to capture that effort as well. And so there will be a buoy available for people that are kind of casual that come on the beach hopper or something and go into the water and do it that way. But um, we wanna be able to have the, this good effort that's done on the reef that is um, consistent with what the state is asking us to achieve. So, um, you know, but if we want everyone to be really trained that it's gonna work on the project and to report their data. That's actually one of the more critical things is that we are able to communicate effectively and self-organize and to be able to communicate with the resource managers about whether this project was successful or not in order to determine the next steps that they'll, um, we can ask them to, uh, to allow us to do in the future. Jen, shall we take a live question? Okay, I see um, Nicholas DeGarmo has a hand up and wants to ask a question. Could you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? So I'm wondering how much um, assistance have you gotten from the state once you were um, once you had increased the bag limit, were they pretty much on board with following along your protocols or were you sort of instructed to um, take um, an unlimited amount of urchins on your own or was that something that the state kind of proposed? Yeah, so it, initially we tried to get the rules changed for Monterey and but all of our rule changes went to the North Coast. So the limit was raised from 35 urchins to 20 gallons of urchins per diver per day uh, in the in the north coast in uh, certain counties in Sonoma and Mendocino County. Then that was changed again to allow more, to allow 40 gallons per diver per day, and also included um, another county, included Humboldt County as well in, in that uh, set of rules. And so that is the rule. Uh, you, you can go and take 40 gallons per diver per day in these counties, but um, what we found is that you really need a sustained, persistent effort. It needs to be divers diving on the site Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and enlarging this area and pushing it out into other areas. So um, well, there is, an, okay, while we have this rule at Tankers Reef in Monterey that allows unlimited smashing of purple and red urchins, the, uh, at Casper Cove in Mendocino, uh, they have a similar rule that has the same timeline as ours, and it's only for purple urchins in one place in uh, that area. So uh, the state has been really good about uh, giving us these, this change in rules for us to, uh, to be able to do our work. And um, it was, you know, it was hard fought, you know, it's hard to convince them that this is the right thing, but they have uh, 
change that rule. And one of the, the big things I'm sure you're from Oregon, uh, and there's a few people here from Oregon that are going through the same exercise and trying to determine what are, what are the rules that, that are for their state, right? How do they franchise what we're doing into another area with a different whole new set of different rules for a different state? And so um, there's something called wanton waste where you're not allowed to kill something just to kill it and hang it on a wall. You have to consume it. And that was a real obstacle for us for a long time. And um, we have overcome that uh, by some different legislation in the California Environmental Quality Act. We were able to find an exemption for this kind of activity and an eradication feature. So I hope that answers your question, Nicholas. Keith, I was just going to say we have several more questioners waiting patiently. Mm -hmm. um, I see one uh, that was sent in by the chat, but um, I'll attempt to answer and then we'll take our next live questioner. Um, Ian asks, what's the minimum dive experience? What kind of task loading is involved? Um, so um, you should have, as we mentioned, um, open water certification, experience diving in Monterey. Um, I would suggest about 20 Monterey area or equivalent cold water dives um, or more, of course. Um, and as far as task loading, uh, we will be asking people with scientific diver experience or certification to count their urchins. But for people who are newer divers or haven't done scientific work underwater, um, it's basically going to be control your buoyancy, hammer urchins carefully, and um, know where you are so that after the dive you can report where, that you, where you've worked. So I think that's a fair representation of the task today. Would you agree, Keith? I agree, yes. Okay, um, Laura White, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Is Sorry, thank you. The host wasn't letting it. me. Thank you. <laughs> I did actually try to unmute, but it said the host had to do something. So my question is, after we register, will we be notified which dive shop we can take the course through? Yes. Yeah, so once you register, when we have uh, these classes available, we're going to send out to all the divers on the registration list where they can take this class. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Tom uh, Calvinese, do you, you want to ask a question, Tom? He's turned his video off and it's muted, but there's Tom. Tom, you're muted. Tom, Tom, you're still muted. There you go. Okay, I think uh, somebody, Keith, somebody let me talk. Thank you. You're going to be sorry now, but. Uh, oh. uh, <laughs> First, uh, shout out to my other, my friends in Oregon, Nicholas and Lee up north. Um, guys are rock stars. I'm looking forward to getting some, getting something going, getting in the water here in Oregon. And you guys are, this is really exciting. You've done some great work here. I'm uh, very inspiring. And I'm looking forward to joining you in this, uh, I hate to call things a battle, but this does kind of feel like a battle these days with a very spiny uh, adversary. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And if you've ever had a, a rough encounter with a bag of urchins, you know what I'm talking about. It's not fun. Um, so I have a couple of quick questions and then I'll uh, leave time for others. And of course, we'll follow up with Keith and others on some other details. But um, one of my questions is, I, I think I saw in the, pre in the uh, presentation that you were, um, that divers were getting permits. And I was, uh, I think I missed the detail there. Are, is the state offering a sort of a specialty commercial permit or is this a, per, a, a rec permit? What can you say yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah, see, this is all recreational activity and our rule is carved out of uh, recreational sport fishing rules. So we're not really talking about um, commercial efforts. At, at this point. So it's um, it's regular sport fishing rules. You need a fishing license. And uh, we have to, as divers, we have to buy our individual licenses. Yeah. So I, I think that's great. I love that you guys are doing scholarships to, to get help people out with their, uh, their license. Um, 
And my other question has to do with the red urchin question. Uh, I, I used to work as an urchin diver, so have lots of experience with reds. And so far, you know, we aren't seeing the problem with reds, but I hear what you're saying about what happened and what, how the reds responded when you removed all the purples. My question is, uh, do you have any data on red urchin population or densities prior to purple urchin removals or anything that would give you a clue about what was gonna happen when you took the purples away? Um, we had population densities, um, just kind of the baseline that is from reef check, right? Had, had monitored all of the uh, population densities of purple and red urchins and other invertebrates um, as part of the regular kelp forest monitoring. So we have an idea what the um, red urchin population looks like in the central coast. and. Generally, the red urchin uh, numbers, the densities of them, increase as you go north in California. Um, and there's some different factors for why that may be, including commercial red urchin fishing um, is having an impact on the, those, those fisheries as well. So um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I could go on, but I'm going to give it back to you guys. And thanks so much for putting this together. Thanks, Tom. Really Good to talk to you to again. See how, how it turns out. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Keith, I just spotted another, um, I thought, pretty good question from the chat window that I'd like to uh, relay in. Uh, the, the questioner asks, uh, this was Ken, how do current instructors get certified to teach the class? Um, which I thought was a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, uh, Nawi and Patty are currently processing applications to make kelp forest restoration an official specialty in which you can get a certification card through instructors of those two agencies. Uh, we may uh, approach more agencies in the future, but for now, those are the two where uh, we've applied, we've sent in paperwork to apply. So um, when the course content is finished, um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to do this with instructors, um, at the very end of this month or early in April. Uh, and again, I'm hoping that's where we'll end up on the calendar. We will announce to everybody who's registered on the G2KR website. So go to G2KR, sign up for the newsletter and also register as a volunteer diver. And we will send everybody whose contact information we have notification that train the trainer or instructor training um, is going to be available when we have dates for it. So get in touch and we'll let you know. And thank you very much for that question. Uh, I believe Ron Miller is the next hand up. Ron, Ron is one of our uh, advocates that has spoken at uh, several of our meetings. I usually run in, uh, the last time I ran into Ron was at a fishing game commission in Sacramento and we used to go in person. Yeah, good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for Two and a half years up on the north coast, so it's good to see something a little bit closer to Santa Cruz where I'm at. So, thanks for uh, all your effort on that. Um, could you just give us a, a, an overview of the timeline with the project? Um, you know, when it starts. You may have said already, I just missed it. Uh, how long it's going to run for? And uh, you know, particularly, I'm interested in you know how, how quickly do we need to get to a point where we could you know we we have enough data so that you know we show efficacy. In time to kind of get into the cycle to uh, open up some MPAs for next year, if, if that's even possible, and maybe it's more like a 2023 20, activity for that. But can you just give us a little insight into all those questions? Yeah, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll take this one, Mark. The, um, the rule is written in uh, when it becomes a, a effective is from April 1st, April Fool's Day uh, in 2021, and it'll run for three years. And that's at the same time as what's happening up at the replicate site, replicate site up at the North Coast at Casper Cove. So that's the timeline for that when the, the, the law takes effect. But you know, we really want to do this the right way and do it safely. And so when, when the class is done and we're ready, we will begin. So um, it's weather dependent and it's dependent on whether we are the, the grid is down and everything is all the ducks are in a row to get started. Um, so that's, it's definitely happening this spring, but when I would expect it sometime in April would be the time to look for that. 
Um, in terms of whether we can get into the other areas in the future, the, the, there's three state agencies. There's, well, there's three agencies. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is federal. There is the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Ocean Protection Council all made the joint uh, monitoring recommendations. And they laid out very specific criteria and ways for us to measure success. So what we've been very upfront with them is that we want res to have uh, an evaluation at the end of this season to determine if we're effective. And then we'll make the case for going into the marine protected areas next year. Um, but you're, I think you're alluding to too, is that the, the MPA process is in, being decided right now. There is a decadal review that is up at the end of next year. So uh, we need to have change state policy uh, to make that a reality in, in the next season, in, in the next season, if possible. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Keith, and Th all well, really appreciate your effort. Very good. Thanks, Thanks Ron. Ron. Hey, look out, Keith. I see uh, a hand up from a longtime friend of the project who's spoken at very many Fish and Game Commission meetings and uh, knows a lot. So I'm hoping this is a softball question coming from Melanie Moreno. Hey, Keith. Uh, so I have a question. People are asking about uh, how long of a swim it is, and, and I've responded to that. Uh, but what about the beach hopper or any of the other local dive boats? Are any of them planning on doing any trips out to tankers or urchin calling uh, divers? Uh, yes, uh, Brian Nelson, uh, who is a uh, co-owner of the beach hopper with Mary Jo Nelson now, they express a lot of interest in this. And when we first approached them about it, Brian said, well, we'll just put a little bucket of hammers here by the, by the swim step. And when they go out, they'll just take a hammer with them. Um, and, but we had you know, make something first before we could do that. But the, the time is ripe for that. And they're very much on board with that. And um, you know, we're gonna make it part of the effort here to go out that way. Um, it is easier to get out there by boat. Uh, Going from shore, it's is about 800 feet to the site or thereabouts, and but what it involves a lot of time is going to be a long walk on a sandy beach with all your gear on your back, right? Because it's a ways down the beach to get into to cut the angle down. You want to get further down, so um, but there will be buoys out there, and you'll be able to spot them and try to make your your way out to that to that spot. So um, lots of opportunities for people. It's great in that this site in that it, there's no tide pools to, to disturb and everything else like that. We just don't wanna make a burden for state parks by leaving you know, uh, a bunch of urchins in the trash and, and, and making a mess of things. We wanna be good ocean stewards and be respectful and, and not be a burden on uh, other agencies and stuff that, uh, like parks and so on. I have a, a follow-up to that. Uh, so what about divers who don't, want to get the certification. Is there any opportunity for them to call urchins out on tankers? Um, for divers that don't want to get the certification, see the certification is, is designed so that um, it is available to everybody and is economically inclusive and that all the divers that want to participate can participate. There are some other certifications like Reef Check, uh, California Volunteers and the AAUS Volunteers that have undergone more rigorous training and they have an eco diver certification. Um, so if someone had taken that certification, um, then they would just take the online portion and uh, be able to uh, come out and, and dive on the project. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. Always. Uh, there's a diver named Sumakov uh, who's got a hand raised. And if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Natalia and um, I have a question. So uh, does any funding from ReefCheck reach you? Because I usually donate uh, to ReefCheck uh, as, as often as I can. Uh, so do you accept like separate donations or do they share it with you? Right, well, we are good partners with ReefCheck California. I mean, I'm a ReefCheck volunteer and we expect that a lot of ReefCheck volunteers will be on this project. 
Um, you can donate to through the GoFundMe. That's fine. You can also donate to ReCheck. Uh, actually, a lot of the funds that we got, we're pulling together with ReCheck to pay for uh, ReCheck interns and uh, for the charters and so on. So they can do a lot of their work. Their, their portion grew a lot. And they volunteered to do all this grid and everything else too. So to really help us out. So we want to make sure that uh, you know they are made whole. Um, I want to add a word of thanks to Reef Check, who just stepped into the project and volunteered to do um, what to me is a daunting task of laying down hundreds of meters of cables and lines on the uh, experimental area so that we can recognize and navigate that thing easily. Uh, and I just think that's a huge, tremendous contribution. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Tyler Durden has a hand up. Can you unmute yourself, Tyler, and ask your question? Uh, certainly, thank you. Uh, first for the project and, uh, and the presentation tonight. I was just curious who sets the pricing and is that dive shop specific? Um, and uh, if that's negotiable or how that works, because I know there's a lot of people who'd have trouble tossing $200 into that, um, even though I'm sure the instruction is going to be excellent. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take the first whack at that. Thank you for the question. It's a good question. Uh, so the, the first part is yes, the, the course pricing as for um, you know, basic certification is set by the instructor in the dive shop with whom you sign up. Uh, I've had a couple responses from local instructors who's made me think that that 200 to, you know, and up range is probably in the ballpark. Um, um, I've heard rumors that some of the clubs who have instructors within the club uh, will be offering this course at a hugely discounted rate, uh, perhaps as low as just covering out-of-pocket costs. So, uh, if the two hundred, if the money is an obstacle, uh, check around with the local clubs, and also uh, remind you what Jen talked about with that scholarship program, uh, because we really don't want anybody to be vented from pitching in um, for money. Uh, was there another piece of that question that I've bypassed? No, that's where I, I think about the negotiation, whether you negotiate with your um, your dive instructor or not. I, I, I really kind of approached it as being, you know, we're going to present this class and we'll leave it up to the dive um, instructors to determine their own pricing because everyone has different structures. They can bundle it with a specialty or other things. And so in, in some respects, it's it's kind of it's not our business. It's their business, how they how the, their business model is and how they you know, want to approach this and, um, you know, take part in this effort. So um, it's kind of up to them, you know, and I, I would leave it at that. I, I guess I could add that the, the outpouring of uh, volunteerism that you people are demonstrating just by being here tonight uh, doesn't stop with you. Uh, almost every dive shop uh, owner and employee we've talked to has basically said, how can I help? Uh, it's been fabulous. Hey, Mark, there is another question here that I think is in your wheelhouse here. It says, go for it. It's from Ian uh, to everyone. It says, what is the minimal optimal dive experience? What kind of task loading can newer divers anticipate? Uh, I think I responded to that, um, but it's a great question. So quickly, um, Open water certification, be comfortable diving in cold, um, limited visibility water of Monterey. Uh, I would recommend 20 or more dives in the Monterey area, but you know, you just, you need to be undaunted by putting on all that gear and getting into the, into the water at Del Monte Beach. Uh, I see Sachant with a hand up and I will ask you to unmute and ask your question. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Um, kind of just piggybacks off the question you were just at, uh, answering, but so if somebody has under 20 of the cold water dives, um, is that something you would recommend that they wait, achieve their 20, 
and signed up for the certification. Since the certification course is only one dive within the training program, could they do it kind of in tandem where they're doing, you know, the, the certification course now and then also be trying to get towards their 20 cold water dives? Because most of my dives are warm water dives. So I'm thinking, how do I get involved as quickly as possible, but still meet that criteria? Uh, so I'll answer that by saying, uh, first of all, go diving, which is always <laughs> a good idea. Um, uh, I, I hope the weather will clear up enough that you can get a few of those dives in between um, now and uh, mid to late April, which I think is when we'll be ready to offer the class to, uh, to everybody. I hope it is. Uh, um, as far as whether you actually you have to have exactly 20 and 19 is not enough. Um, it really depends on your level of comfort and related experience. So you mentioned having had warm water dives. Um, what I would do is get a version of the kelp forest restoration specialty class that is a two dive class because I said as I mentioned some instructors will be doing this as a one dive and some as a two dive. Go with the two dive. Um, explain your experience level to the instructor that you'll be working with and your concerns and she or he will just watch you while you're diving and be able to form an assessment of where your diving skills lay and advise you as what if anything else they think you should you specifically should do um, before you jump out there on your own and start flailing at urchins and I want to say, okay. for, as and then, you so sound like a new diver, that, and I um, want to thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I've done it since, I mean, for over 15 years, but it's always been very limited. So I want to get understand what yeah. I need to get involved with the program. And then you guys have talked about clubs and local shops to, you know, take the course through. I'm in Santa Cruz. So are the closest ones down to Monterey or will you guys, do you guys have a list of ones that are participating with these kind of courses, this course? Yeah, like like when the when they come online, when we, we get the, the dive instructors that are gonna teach the class, we will let everybody know via the newsletter uh, who's participating in it and where you can go to take this class. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and um, I, I, like you, live in the Santa Cruz area and uh, I'll, I'll be reaching out to the local shops to see if they want to get involved. But uh, remember the, the quote classroom, as we would call it session, uh, section of the class is actually online and self-paced. And then the diving itself is gonna be in Monterey at Tankers Reef. Um, so you can reach out to um, whoever you like really. Yeah, it, it, and if I could, Put, put kind of two things together here because you had also mentioned about the dive clubs as well. And one of the things we realize is that you know dive clubs can get a lot more people to come out than individual divers. You know, it's hard for people to get motivated and it's cold and everything else. But um, if we can get the dive clubs to participate, um, like Alan, who has his hand up, and I'd like to hear his question <laughs> next, um, who has been instrumental in, in talking about this and, and bringing this up to people and, and their club is very much involved in this. Alan, you have a question? Well, thanks. Well, I just wanted to thank Mark and um, Keith and, and Jen for putting this together. This is really good. And yeah, I'll just mention in response to what you said, Keith, that uh, I hope, I'm hoping some of the instructors in our club will be teaching it when we teach uh, advanced and rescue diving, we just do it for the cost of material. So it's, you know, as inexpensive as, as it can be. So I, I, what I understand is that once we register at your site, Keith, we'll get a message as to where those places are that we can go. And maybe you can call around and uh, find out where the best price is if you're concerned about that. Uh, second question that I guess I had is that um, I'm getting some reading here that people are thinking, well, maybe I don't need the certification. I can just go in and, and call the urchins. And I could be mistaken, so maybe one of you can comment on it. But it seems to me as one of the things we're trying to demonstrate here is that we can do this to the state, is that we can do this safely, that we can, we can do it in a way that they will then 
uh, feel comfortable with us going into other other sites into the MPAs. Yeah, people are going to go in there and haven't had their training and aren't doing it properly. That can be a black eye for us. And so, I, I assume that you know when you log in after a dive, if you want to contribute, that you need to put down some type of certification. And I don't know whether reef check or other certifications are going to be allowed too, but you know, I really encourage everybody to try to take the class and understand how to do this safely so that when we go to these meetings, that they'll have a good good feeling about what we do and, and allow us to go into the MPAs. Um, it might also be helpful, I'll just mention this, a lot of, I know our club teaches navigation diving, and it'd be a good idea if you could go in and get a class on navigation beforehand that make you a lot more comfortable in following the grid and, and, and just doing that that sort of work. And, and buoyancy control is, is an important thing when you have a bunch of urchins that you're trying not to kneel on, right? Well, yes. <laughs> so anyway, I, I just wanted to yeah. make those, those, those comments. Looking forward no, to helping wherever that, I can. Thank you. I, yeah, I that's, wanna, uh, go ahead. I wanna offer a shout out for Al Throop who just mm -hmm. asked that very intelligent question. Al has been, uh, an organizer of dive clubs, a friend of the diving community, and a great advocate for marine conservation uh, for as long as I can remember. I mean, I remember 17 years ago when we were pushing the MPAs and he was organizing people to come to Fish and Game Commission meetings when we were working on that effort. Um, so thank you so much, Al. Yeah, I, I think, Alan, your, your, your point is well taken uh, that we don't want to create a problem for ourselves by doing things that we shouldn't, or by doing things that are um, causing a uh, bycatch situation or damage to other uh, creatures on the bottom. There, you know, we don't want to be because the the state and federal agencies are actually going to be watching us to see how much damage we do to the other um, uh, creatures on the reef, and so. It's a real concern, not just to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, but also to the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. Rietta Holman, I saw her on this call as well. And uh, they are looking at to the, to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to see how this goes, to see if these efforts are don't cause damage to the benthic environment, then maybe they could do them in Sonoma County, where right now you have to go all the way to Mendocino to do it. So, there's, there's lots to be gained by doing it right and uh, by communicating effectively and by entering the data. But that benthic disturbance is something that um, it's, it's on their radar and it's very important that uh, we do it right. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, we're currently having a wonderful cooperative relationship with uh, representatives and scientists from uh, the state Department of Fish and Wildlife, who report to the Fish and Game Commission, who are the people making the rules that we have to abide by, um, and also from representatives of the National Marine Sanctuary. And you know, for me, after fighting conservation fights for years, uh, this kind of a collaborative thing is just so refreshing and wonderful. Um, a little bit, uh, well, Keith, was, Keith brought the original petition over two years ago, and it's been a long uphill slog uh, that we, to, to which we got, you know, we reached success last December. At, during that point, there was a, uh, a person who had uh, some pull with the commission who used the phrase uh, vigilante diver horde uh, uh, about people who had uh, reputedly uh, gone out on their own in violation of, uh, of regulations and, and wax emergence. Um, as far as we know, the whole story was uh, a myth, um, but uh, the, the specter of something like that was raised. And so what we really need to do is demonstrate that as a diving community, we can self-organize um, and we can be a force for good in the water so that we leave a bottom that looks better than when we found it. And the only difference is that we took urchins away from it um, and didn't bang our knees and our fins on the bottom and crush anemones and that sort of thing. Um, so 
um, for that reason, Alan's uh, advice to please take the class is really well taken. And I'll just augment my uh, response to Sashant and say, um, I, I neglected to mention what a fabulous resource exists in dive clubs. So if you're not super familiar with this area, um, hook up with a club uh, near you. Uh, if you don't know one, um, contact me and I'll put my email in the chat right now. Uh, and, and I can refer you to a couple that are near where you live. Um, the knowledge just in the brains of the people in those clubs like Al Throop is spectacular. Yeah, I, I would even go so far as to say that this is like a trust exercise. This is not really about smashing urchins in a way. I mean, we're gonna smash urchins and we'll get that part done, but we're trying to build trust with these state agencies. And we do that by, by our example, right? So um, that's really the exercise. This is, this is a social exercise. Can divers do this and do it in a way that uh, fosters that trust with these state agencies that they want us to do more in the future? We want to be part of the solution. To do that, we have to keep that trust. Uh, pardon me, my, my keyboard just froze up. Can one of the uh, other participants who knows my email address put it in the chat for people like Sashant? And I don't know if we have any other questions. I don't see any more raised hands. Um, there was a question for how long, how many months will the project be going on? Um, this is from Allison uh, Stewart Cotis. Um, the, the, the project runs for three years, uh, beginning in April, and uh, will uh, will not dive when it's bad conditions. So we have a season in Monterey that'll probably run till about October or so, so that'll kind of be the end of our season. Um, and then we'll just take it up each year. Um, hopefully we can get through a lot of it, you know? I mean, I would love for so many divers to come out that we run out of land and we have to go ask for more, right? But we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a little story that when, when the state agencies, they, they came with their joint agreement and they said, well, we think that you can do like, like one to two acres of, of culling urchins uh, on this, two and a half acre plot, uh, you know, or you, you can do that. But, you know, I told him, you know, I think this is, we have a different concept because I'm thinking about 50 acres, you know, is what we're gonna be doing out there. So um, we wanna exceed their expectations and just show them we're gonna do aerial surveys and near infrared, we can do underwater robotics, we're gonna map the whole thing. We're gonna communicate with them like, so they, are tired about hearing from us. So um, that's that's kind of our, our, our goal is to, you know, whatever they're, they want two urchins per, per square meter. If you've ever done this project kind of thing before, you, you lose track, you know, you're trying to smash and moving around what's your buddy doing this kind of thing. And so um, it's really easy to kind of not track the numbers so, so well. And we're doing purples and red urchins. So, you know, it's difficult to keep track of two things in your head at the same time. You know, um, but we are not requiring people necessarily to count urchins. We want to know bottom time. We want to know level of effort for people. So um, we're trying to make it so that you know urchins smash or smash, right? They don't count. They don't. They don't point at urchins or or try to keep track of those numbers. If they just uh, they have a job to do and to do it well. And uh, we'll be doing some other things. So we'll be looking for some invasive species when we're out there, and we'll you learn about more about that in the class. Um, but um, yeah, that's our. I have a follow-up question in, in regards to that. So, outside of that 100 by 100 grid, if someone were to smash urchins, do they still need to log it? Yes, they need okay. to log that, and there'd be a way for them to do that on the the dive on the dive portal because we have a, a buoy system too, where we will off the grid be able to put a buoy down and they'll be able to go to the buoy and do their work on this buoy that will be moving off the grid. Um, we'll start with the grid and then we'll keep expanding off the grid and have a large persistent effort. And we will just expand that area so that it, it spreads out over the reef where, where the urchins are. Got it, thank you. Thank you, good question. I have a question regarding hammers. 
are there specific hammers which are approved? Do divers need to buy hammers? Can they bring their own if they meet certain requirements? What are the recommendations for, for hammers? I had a computer problem, but I think you can hear me again now. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Um, can, you, can you answer this question, Mark? Uh, I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, okay. Yeah, we, um, we, we've actually done a hammer testing, believe it or not, and have uh, selected a hammer that we think is the best. Um, one of the properties of this hammer is it is fairly lightweight and easy to manage along with dive gear. And because it's lightweight, divers are less likely to smash more than just the urchin that they've got their, their, their eyes lined up on. Um, so we're, we're recommending that specific hammer and uh, we've already laid in a small supply of them that we will make available through g2kr.com and as we need more, oh there it is. There's one here. This one has a different lanyard on it, but it's basically a, a welding hammer, right? So welding hammers seem to work good underwater uh, and it has a little like a spring on it that like if you're welding it would keep your hand cool, but it also kind of relieves the fatigue of smashing onto a rock substrate for an hour, right? So um, that's not very heavy and uh, it makes, you want to be careful that you don't like, you get in the surf and have it come down on you or something. So um, yeah, those are the hammers. So again, as with whether you're legally obligated to take the class before you go attempt to do urchin culling in the legal area, it's not a legal requirement, um, but highly recommend using that particular hammer just because if you bring your own oh let's say baby sledge um you might get the urchin that you're aiming at and a bunch of other stuff as well and that wouldn't be so good right we don't want tools that help you to like dig deep within cracks kind of thing and, and get a lot of bycatch and you, know, you shouldn't be swinging at things that you can't see you know so um it's kind of the idea we have a nice hammer but of a, a limited length that pull out urchins and smash them on, on better substrates when they're down in the bowls. We don't want to, you know, um, pierce nudibranchs and things like that because that they like to live in the urchin canopy um, of their spines. You know, they live inside of them. So you hit the urchin, you might just push down on it. So we have a lot of experience with this. We've been doing it for a couple of years. We've tried all kinds of different hammers and we keep coming back to this one. So we like it. Thank you, Mark and Keith. I, I saw another question in the chat regarding uh, divers having a, some sort of website to communicate and post when they will go out for urchin culling. I've, for instance, the Waterman, on the Waterman's Alliance page, a lot of folks will post, hey, I'm going out on this day, I'm looking for a buddy. Are we envisioning some sort of platform for divers to organize amongst themselves? Yes. So what we're going to do is when, when we get rolling here with operations, we'll have assignments. So you'll be able to go to a website and ask for the next assignment and you will be picking out uh, one on, on a list there. Well, actually it'll be assigned to you in order. And then you can organize your own, you and your buddy to go out there and, and to do that effort. Um, we're not organizing large group events to go out there and, and do uh, calling. The, the problem being that with COVID, we can't have large events, right? We had to restructure our entire thought process when COVID happened, did not be large. You know, I had pictured divers arm to arm going out there and smashing urchins, but with this kind of, uh, uh, you know, situation, it has to be more managed, more uh, scheduled with people to do these things individually. I think that People can get together in larger groups, you know, maybe later on when people get vaccinated and stuff, but maybe through dive clubs is probably the best way to organize or, or you and your friends, you know, you're all uh, going out or you meet people through this process and go out and, and, and do these efforts together. Um, but that, that's where, where we're coming up. There was a question here from uh, Nikki Das to everyone. Is this, Assuming seven millimeter suits aren't ideal for this, is there anything recommended in your dry suit, uh, if you're uh, dry suit certified, I think is the question, or non, non dry suit certified. And I, I'll tell you that I, I own two dry suits and um, I've been using a wetsuit uh, one after the other for the last year because 
it, it's just kind of easier when I'm doing urchins to um, not have something that has uh, infinite points of failure, right? I dry suit, it'd be pretty easy to make a hole in it. And then, because uh, you're on urchins, right? So um, it, it seems kind of easier to just use a wetsuit. And even though you would get colder, I usually get colder in, in the wetsuit, but you're doing work, right? You're, you're moving, you're smashing, you're doing these things. And so um, it, it, I, don't, I don't feel cold, you know, maybe it's the Canadian in me, but I, it seems okay for, the, for this kind of activity. Uh, and probably easier for you to maintain your buoyancy and trim and all that with um, than if you're doing this while you're in a dry suit and you don't want to put your head down on a dry suit because the air goes to your feet. So I, I kind of recommend a wetsuit, really, uh, but you can use anything you like, of course. We had a question in the chat from Sean. Uh, will you have GPS coordinates posted for the four corners of the grid so I can drop anchor outside, but close to it? Yeah, good one. Uh, we're going to have mooring balls uh, positioned outside of, of, the, of the grid. And the mooring ball, you'll be able to take your boat and just tie up to the mooring ball and then go down the line. And there'll be a line at the bottom that goes to the grid. And then you go on the grid and then you find the, the number you're supposed to start at and you, you do your work that way. Um, we don't want people to obviously drop an anchor on our grid and then pull it all up with their boat anchor, right? That would be a disaster. Um, so we're trying to make it make it that way for people to, um, you know, and we will mark the corners of the grid uh, with the yellow uh, buoys, but we may not have them up the entire time. They're, they're, they're good for reference so that, because once you're off the grid, then, then the grid becomes an exclusion zone. So we wouldn't want people to accidentally, like as they're calling urchins, meander into the, the grid and start calling urchins that we don't know what they did. So um, we, we can mark the corners with the buoys and it'll probably be seasonally like that. Um, and then it'll, it should help too to look at the spot up in shore and to see dramatically where the kelp you know, that we establish that that's gonna survive because of our efforts, how it's gonna really blossom. Uh, and ex expand in this area with those with those buoys as a reference. Um, there's some people are saying that they have registered for the GTPR, but haven't heard anything. I, I am sorry about that. We were trying to prepare for this webinar in the past few days here, and it's taken up a lot of our time. But uh, some people have already registered. I, I asked people um, in previous months to pre-register uh, for the course, and about 20 people or so had uh, pre-registered for the course. And so we opened it up to registration from them a, a week early. And so they could get the lowest numbers because, you know, that's important to get a low number, right? I mean, that's, that's bragging rights. So uh, uh, Louise Woolley, who is one of our awesome uh, fundraising donors here, uh, that should register twice for it. But a little patience, uh, we will respond to everybody and tell you what your registration number is. Thanks for the question, Louise, and everything else. <laughs> You're awesome. Uh, Keith, I, I don't see any more raised hands. Uh, we're an hour and 20 minutes into this, which for the number of questions and the amount of information, I think is pretty darn efficient. Uh, so shall we, shall we call it a night? Yeah, let's. And uh, I know it says recording right now, but um, you know, we can simplify this a little bit. And we will make the recording available to people later, and we'll notify you that are registered. and. If you are on the newsletter uh, from the G2KR website, uh, you'll definitely get the notification. And we'll put it on Facebook and everything too. Uh, we want to continue to, for people to view this and, and be able to uh, understand and to register for the, uh, for the dining room. Yeah, so um, thanks to everybody who attended. Um, please do go to g2kr.com. And uh, there's a, a how to help button, which will get you um, on the newsletter list. And then follow the link in the chat for registering as a volunteer urchin calling diver. Uh, and we will get word out to everybody on those lists about when the next evolution of the class, uh, that'll be uh, instructor training. And by the time we get to that, we should have a pretty good idea when the, the classes for general public will become available. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jen and Mark, for the for this great presentation, I think, that, that we pulled off in the, in, in the nick of time here.
um, it, you know, it, some of these things that they, it takes a long time to get to this point, but then, you know, it's always the last part that, that we have to get to. Uh, thanks to Keith thanks Rootsart. To Melanie for, too. And yeah. Melanie too, for she, yeah. she was instrumental in helping the, with, put together some of these slides and pictures and anything else. So, uh, and thanks to Keith really Rootsart for starting and leading the charge for the last two plus years. Yeah, well, I mean, thanks for that. It's amazing to be at this point. It is amazing that we're here, but it's not because of anything that I did by myself. You know, I, I mean, I, I helped to lead this and to, to make the petition, but I went by myself and I was denied. This only worked because everybody came. You know, the whole diving community stepped up and they said they wanted to do this. And so now's the time, you know, this is what you asked for. Let's, let's get it done. And uh, you know, like 92% of divers said they wanted to do this. So that's a mandate. You know, I mean, you can't get 92% of people to agree about anything these days. So uh, take that to heart and uh, come on out and let's get it done. Let's draw a line of sand and, you know, make the ocean a better place. Here, here. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.